السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام the the floor is yours I just hit the record بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم I actually I'm not going to speak too long yesterday brother and sister actually sister ليلى broke my heart in fact she make me cry in fact and uh, I'm not praising sister Layla I'm saying the truth what in my heart I want to speak to you brothers and sisters I know sister Layla for years in fact before I got my PhD in, in Sharia I know sister Layla in fact in fact one of the reason actually I got PhD in Sharia in the, the fiqh is the sunnah followers that it that's the main reason I got PhD and alhamdulillah I mean I was the PhD I was one of the number one in the university because I want to do something my intention not money because alhamdulillah my other PhD in Sharia in, in geology so I'm a professor at university I don't have money so the only the only concentration I want to make da'wah and sunnah followers one of the encouragement but I want to say before I speak more about Sister Layla, as everybody loves Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In Mecca, his, his uncle, Abu Talib, Abu Talib, his uncle, when the people of Quraysh, his own family, they came to Abu Talib to speak with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they told him exactly, if you want money, we'll give him money. To live the Islam, of course. You want wife, we'll give you multiple wife. We'll give you anything. If you have sihr, we'll give you somebody to cure from sihr, magic. Many things. Just to leave what he's doing to give us, us the Islam. And he came to him, Abu Talib, the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu my, because he is the, his uncle, the son of my brother. brother. The people, if you, your people, your, your family told you so and so and so and so and so. To leave what you are, to, to give the message, the shahada, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Our example, the one we love so much. Qala wallahi ya'ma, wallahi, by Allah, la wad'u al-shamsa fi yameeni. والقمر في شمالي. If they move, if they put the sun, the sun in my right hand and the moon in my right in the left hand, على أن أترك هذا الأمر to leave this matter, ما تركته. I will never leave it until I أهلك دول أو or I die with it. The people following the Sunnah, my dear brother and sister, they fight strong, courage. You know where they don't care about the dunya, about names and followers. The number of the people is not the problem. Is not that the problem? If you give a right statement from whom Allah subhanahu wa taala's message, don't worry about how many people follow you. Don't worry about that. The key. حديث الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم قال بلغوا عني ولو آية one, one, one word, one statement say that, teach it to the others by the way we will love رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ابن مكة first his own family slandered him, speak bad, 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 bad and the Sahaba too they, are, they left مكة المدينة and who over there? Yahud, the Jews. And it's Quraysh together. Quraysh together. You try. 25 years. 25 years. Try to hurt Rasulullah Sallallahu But Rasulullah Sallallahu is a strong man. His word is strong. He's firm with the Sharia. By the way, he smiled too. He smiled. The key, he always smile. Even when somebody come to him, he smile to them. When somebody say against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like what Sister Layla spoke about it, yes, we have to defend the word of Allah and the word of Rasulullah. 
So many brothers and sisters. In fact, as you know, when I was in the hospital, I, I, lived, I lived in the hospital. I used to teach in the hospital. Then after three years, I'm in a coma, complete coma. And believe it or not, I woke up my eyes. My wife, Jazallah Khair, my Annie, her name Annie Lynn, she put a sign in front of me. When I opened my eyes, and actually I, they tied my hands and have a cube in my mouth. I'm out, out of it. But when I opened my, my eyes, two statements in Arabic and English. Arabic, khalik mutafail. English, be optimistic. And when I just see this statement, and the doctor gave me three months to live, I smile. But I can't speak in that time, period. I can't speak, I can't even walk. But anyway, brother and sister, and I start, every time I open for my, wake up my coma, I look at the statement, be optimistic, khalik mutafaid. And my wife next to me, smile. And my wife, she was working, she left work, she left everything just to take care of me to my life again. My key, my brother and sister, yes. Whatever I speak about Layla, sister Layla, we, we know sister Layla. But the key should not be sad. But in fact, somebody is speaking bad about me, I get hasanat, reward from him. I suppose I give you a gift, please give me, speak about me more bad things. Why? One of the great salihin, they told him, uh, he's a great, he's a muhaddith. They told him so and so and so, they're speaking bad about you. So, and he ever, he ever was happy. And in fact, he gave him a, a gift, a date, and give him a gift to his house. And he said, why are you giving me this? I say, thank you very much. You are slandering, slandering me and speak bad about me. I give you that because I get the reward from you. <laughs> my boy, my dear brother and sister, Sister Layla Ferrell, please, you are strong since I met you for, the, for years. When I wake up from my coma, I ask my wife, number one, I thought myself I'm in Gaza Strip and then no, I am in America. And then I found out the only one asked how is sister, how is Sunnah followers and how is sister Layla? I, imagine, I cannot even remember anything. I cannot remember anything except in the, in the Quran, Alhamdulillah, because I'm read the Quran when I was a kid. So my Salah. But anything, I cannot remember anything else. But I called my bed, I asked Annie, I said, Annie, how was Sister Layla? How was Sunnah followers? I said, just relax, they are okay, they're okay. So Sister Layla is still teaching. So are you sure? I want to make sure Sister Layla don't accept the same thing. But Alhamdulillah, I found out, yes, she's still doing excellent job. In fact, now she's home most of the time. Now she, every single day we see the beautiful Sister Layla. Alhamdulillah. Takbir! <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So it's beautiful, so brother and sister, don't give up. Do not be surrender. Always you have to be strong. Sister Layla, please do your job. And ever, whoever speak about you, smile and continue and increase more and more and more. They are jealous, you get reward. Angry, you get reward. Whatever they do, you get more reward. In fact, we need reward. We, why? Because we want to be with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, with Khadija radiallahu anha, with Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali and Sahaba. And, 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 and me, I got to see with Khalid bin Walid because I love to fight. <laughs> Khalid bin Walid and al -qa -qa. You know, my, my passion always the right to fight. So my point, my dear brother and sister, don't give up. Be strong, because if you're strong, they will be defeated. If you're strong, they will give up. But they just try more and more and more. I said, no, that's it. That's who, our example who? The one we love so, so, so much. Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Somebody speaking about you? Don't, why, 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 why? what is the big deal? Because again, they are increased more and more anxiety and anger and, and, and you call it. So 
ليفت انا وات الله الحكم العدل الله ولاف اكثر از مي بي سيستر ليلى تو توت اسماء الله الحسنى بيوتيفول تو اندر نوت تو مورايز الله الرحمن الرحيم الملك القدس ذا ساكسلي ذا كيدز دو ذات بت يو ستود ان فلانج اندرستاند الله الرحمن الرحيم الملك القدوس السلام وي هاف تو اندرستاند ان فاكت توداي وي سبوك تو سيستر ليلى I know that the book is because I used to memorize this book. Then the camera may be clean. That's it. Bulug al Maram. Bulug al Maram fiqh. I taught this book three universities and around six masajid. But the believe it or not, the majority of the brothers become imams and the sisters they teaching in Islamic schools. The fiqh about the four madahib. But I add this. Why? I add because this is a hadith sahih. But a lot of fiqh in our present time change. The stock market and like business and actually the fiqh of transaction. It changed now a lot. A lot of things change in marriage and wife and many things. We're going to add whatever about in, in new fiqh with this book also. And Sister Lamia Layla will discuss more and more. But Sunnah followers, the key here. Sunnah followers are going to be the center of knowledge, is number one. And maybe, I don't know, brother and sister here, but regardless, female or male or female, as far as you are Muslim, you have to give message. You have. In fact, it's order. Because Rasulullah taught us, بَلِّغُ عَنِّي وَلَوْ آيَةً Give one ayah. And Sunnah followers teach everything, especially the most important thing that Sunnah followers what? عَقِيدَةً and تَوْحِيد Not only talk, speech, special talks. Actually, the followers, actually, the people in very, very famous, they sleep good. No problem with that. But the key, after beautiful lecture, what kind of knowledge you gain? You remember this? But if it's fiqh, aqeedah, tawheed, hadith, it will stay in my mind. Why? Because my life is my life. My life from A to Z. In Arabic, alif ila liya, islam. Islam. And Alhamdulillah, the Quran and the Hadith. This is our Islam. Our Islam. My advice, brother and sister, number one, sister Layla, please, I want to be more strong. More, and you are, the, by the way, I don't ask about courage because you always have encouraged everybody, including my, myself. When I was sick, I cannot even speak. Please do it. Do it. Do it. Now, I'm alive, Alhamdulillah. I fight now also. I do karate every day. I have a gym no. home. So as far as, and please, brothers and sisters, dua for each other is a secret. Sister Laila knows, I don't know if you are followers here, you no, no. The doctor gave me three months to live. Now I'm almost three, five of my life. Why? Because you make dua. Not because doctors. With all my, I respect the doctor, my doctor is beautiful. But the doctor them get to join me, Ibrahim, just give salam to your family because you are, you are dying after three months. Believe it or not, I jog every day, minimum, minimum 10 miles with 60, 60 pounds in my hands. Why? Because the dua, Allah Azza wa Jal, istajab, accept the dua. Could he say, Drooni astajibakum? Make dua. We have to make dua for each other. And imagine the dua for each other accepted. I make dua for, by the way, every salah I make dua. I make adhan home because I just moved and tried to fix my library here. So make dua for all of you, especially yesterday, Sister Layla. Please. I barely to, to cry. Do not make me cry, please. 
really because I love you guys for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the, the key we love each other for the sake of Allah because we love Allah and Rasulullah we love each other with love wallahi with love we can do anything not the, the true love the true love we make difference and also get angry relax say subhanallah wa hamdi astaghfirullah wa atubu everybody memorize إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسَ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ أَفْوَاجًا Here, فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَاسْتَغْفِرْ سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَبَحَمْدِ إِنَّهُ كَارِتَ وَلَا So make astaghfirullah سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَبَحَمْدِ If you get angry سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَبَحَمْدِ astaghfirullah And what our example who? نَصِرُ الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Please, brothers and sisters, let's be united, strong. Following the Sunnah is number one. Not only that, to be warrior for the Sunnah, jihad for the Sunnah, defending the Sunnah. If you defend the Sunnah, Allah defend us, get, protect us. Not only that, make you strong. It's believe in God, you believe is strong. Plus. I have the intention to teach this book for you guys, inshallah. And, but, Sister Lay will tell it to you, I have to discuss it today. This book actually is uh, the Bulugh al-Muram, the Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. Everything about fiqh, all the madai. And me, I add a lot of things because I learn my PhD in Sharia, Islamic, the four madai. Please, brother and sister, don't be worried about tomorrow. Life is very really short. Together will be what? Ala surrim mutakabilin. Bids and we look at each other. Hi, hello, salam alaikum. It's the Lord, Senor. We're going to speak to each other in the Jannah and we're going to look at those people in different world. But me and you, inshallah, with Rasulullah. Sister Layla, please, I do want to see you. And, you know, cry again. Okay, Doki? Alhamdulillah, I'm fine. Alhamdulillah, I had a, a meltdown, but mashallah, I'm back to normal today. I'm feeling good, ready to rock and roll and keep on teaching, like he said, the sooner with the understanding of the companions. And my sister's here, you know, helped me last night. And Dr. Jamali's like a brother to me. So yes, we're, we're fine. We're ready to rock and roll, alhamdulillah. Uh -huh. I love the record roll. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And, and, this, and thank you for joining us and giving us these beautiful words of advice. And I am going to um, let you guys know how to buy that book because you can purchase that book at uh, Darul Islam. And it's an excellent book. It'll help you to under, it's the juris, Islamic jurisprudence. It'll go hand in hand with what you guys are already learning about Tawheed. And you're also learning the meaning of those hadiths. So we're going to talk more about that now, make more uh, to advertise it and stuff too, inshallah. But Dr. Jamali, thank you for joining and sharing all of this with us. And we love you for the sake of Allah. And like I say, you've always been here with us. You are one of the Sunnah pioneers of the Sunnah followers. That is for sure. Uh -huh. You know that. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Inshallah. I'm going to still, I'm going to watch you now. I'm going to listen to you, inshallah. Okay. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa alhamdulillah. Okay, guys, inshallah. Beautiful words of encouragement from Dr. Jamali. And as you guys know, we've been speaking about the lawful and the unlawful. And our topic has been the lawful and the unlawful in regards to relations between the sexes. And we were focusing in on relationships between the spouses. Today is going to be the last lecture of that, that topic. And we'll move on to the lawful and the unlawful in regards to social relations. But as you guys know, you have a quiz. Layla had a meltdown, but you, she still has a quiz for you guys. So let me put the quiz up on the screen and we can see how well you guys answer these questions. You had a whole day a whole day to ponder the uh, que the questions because I did post them up on Facebook for you. Let me put them up here. Everybody should be able to see. This is a big one. 
What does Allah tell us about menstruation and women in regards to the spouses? Now, a lot of Muslims will come and ask us, uh, Sister Layla, you know, the Christians view uh, a woman and her menses one way. The Jews view a woman and her menses another way. What does Allah mention? What the, what the purpose, what is the menses? Does Allah describe the menses to us at all in Islam? So this is how I want you guys to answer. What does Allah tell us about menstruation and women? And what does he tell us? I'm giving you a clue with the second part in regards to the spouses. That's the clue. You were supposed to memorize the meaning of that verse. What does the law say about menstruation women? Let's see your answers, Facebook. And let's look and see what answers we have in here. <laughs> Brother Shaddy, our youngest student, he wants to know what menses is. Don't worry about it, Shaddy. You don't have to ever deal with menses, <laughs> subhanAllah. <laughs> so you're good. <laughs> But everybody else, what does Allah say about menses? And what does he say about menses between the spouses? The rest of you should know. I didn't join the class. So <laughs> Let's see. People on Facebook. What does the law say about menses, Sister May? What does the law say about menses? Anyone else on Facebook? And my, my Facebook stuff isn't showing up, right? Okay, here's an answer from Sister Isra. She said, a law tells us, he says, oh prophet, Sallallahu alayhi if they ask you about menses, tell them it's a pain for the women and to not engage in relations with your wives during that time. The prophet said you can cuddle and show your love, but don't engage in relations during that time. Good job, Isra. Sister Zarina, she said, Allah tells us in regards to menstruation that it is a pain or a hurt. So refrain from women during their menstruation and do not approach them until they are clean. Good job, Zarina. Sister Hawa, Allah says if they ask you about menstruation, tell them it's a pain. So stay away from them during their menses and do not approach them until they are clean. Okay, good job. Same answer from Awa. Let's see what we have on Facebook. I mean, on Facebook. Let's see. Look at the top here. Sister Khadijah said, "Allah lets us know that menstruation is a pain, and that husband and wife should abstain from relations while the wife is menstruating until she's finished." Good job, Khadijah. Beautiful explanation. Okay. Allah doesn't say anything about not going near the wife and being affectionate. He just tells us no intimacy of that nature until she's purified good job and that's important guys because we'll get to the next question number two illustrates why this is important to understand same answer from fame same answer from sister may same answer from Laylee, and same answer from sarah masha allah Everybody got this right. Brother Tarek said, they ask you about menstruation. Tell them it's a hurt, so refrain from women during their menses. Do not approach until they are clean. And when they have cleansed themselves, you may approach them however you want. Remember, Allah teaches us that he loves those who are clean, but you don't treat them bad or see them as cursed as the people of the book did. Exactly. Because again, the other, uh, the people who came before us, their views of a woman on her menses were totally just ridiculous, very oppressive. Well, the Allah let us know in the Quran that the menses is something that we women have to go through. It's a painful experience for us. So it's better that you brothers not approach us wanting intimacy anyway, because it's unclean and also it's a painful thing for us. 
So when we're going through the menses, refrain from being intimate like that with us because it's a painful, unclean experience for us. But after we're done, then you can resume and do whatever we do naturally. Does everybody understand that? So that's all you have to do. That's all you have to explain. Unfortunately, guys, today, this is something that Dr. I mean, I'm Sheikh Morsi was talking with me about earlier. Nowadays, Islam is becoming so distorted and so strange. People are deviating more and more and more away from the true Sunnah and more and more away from the understanding of those companions. They're trying to use scientists, science and things like that to try to rationalize Islam. And this is the same thing that the Jews did. The prophet said, warned us against doing this, but he said it would happen. You know, once you get popular and think you know the religion, now you want to use science to try to rationalize Allah's laws to the point where you'll start making things lawful that Allah made haram and making things haram that Allah made lawful based on science and all of that. It's happening today. A lot of Allah's laws are being changed when no one it can change the laws of Allah, but Muslims are doing it. And so when a lot of times people will come to you or a new convert will ask, okay, what, what does Islam teach us about menses? And instead of just telling them this in a nutshell, people will go into the science of things. No, just tell them menses is your time a month that you experience pain because every woman does experience it. And also you're unclean to go through that is, and every woman knows it's unclean, okay? So during that time, you just stay away from having intimate relations with your husband. That's it. There's no need to go into the science behind it. But that's what you hear a lot of Muslims doing. So the new converts are confused. They're like, well, what is it? Because I've never been told properly. And not only does Allah tell us you know, about menses, but then the prophet even takes it further. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, again, you want to learn the religion. You learn from the proper source. The prophet Muhammad, he even taught us women how to recognize if we're on our menses. He told us to look at the color of the blood. If it's yellow, if it's brown, if it's black, you're on your menses. If it's clear, you're not. But see, a lot of people, we've deviated so far away from Islam and its truthfulness using all that science. Who cares to hear that? Just make it simple. What did the Allah say about menses? What did the prophet say about a menses? Then the women can understand. Because there's a lot of Muslims that don't even know uh, what the menses is or, or if, am I still on my menses, Layla? They don't know to look at the color of the blood. The color of the blood determines if it's red, if it's brown, if it's if it's a uh, uh, yellow, if it's pink, if it's black. You're on your menses, but if it's clear, if it's no color at all, you're not. It's just that simple, and we learned that from the prophet. You don't need a pamphlet to teach you that. The hadiths already taught us that, but people are not learning the hadiths today. Islam is becoming so distorted. It's going to get worse than this, too, believe it or not, guys. Each year, we're going to be further and further away from the truth. Okay, let's look at question number two. Mashallah, everybody did so well on that question. Let's look at number two, and this is why it's important. When Allah says refrain from women during their menses, what does that mean? When Allah says refrain from women during their menses, what does that mean? Believe it or not, a lot of Muslims do not know what that means. What does it mean when Allah says refrain? What does it mean when Allah says refrain from women? Does that mean you have to go to the mosque? I got one sister who called me on the phone one day. She said, Sister Layla, I've been married for two years. 
every time I have my menses, my husband packs his bag and he goes and either stays at his mother's house or he stays at the mosque. I told her, why, what happened? What do you do something to him or something? She said, no, he told me that Allah says refrain from your wives doing their menses. She said, and that means he cannot be nowhere near me when I'm on my menses. So he goes and stays with his mother for a week or he'll stay at the mosque for a week. Is that what refrain from your wives on their menses mean? Remember, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that we are a simple-minded people. You know, we don't have that. We, it, it's hard for us to figure out simple things. That's why the prophet said, if you are a person of knowledge, if you are a caller to the truth, if you are a daya, you have to be able to break it down. He said, speak to the people in the language they understand. Be down to earth. He said, the people who will be closest to me on a day of judgment are those who are down to earth. Because again, we're a simple-minded nation. We have to break it down. A lot of people read that verse like this brother, he thought that refrain from my wife means go stay away from her until she's done. Is that what it means? Let's see what answers we got on Facebook. What does it mean to refrain from your wife? Laylee said, it means not to have intercourse with your wife during menses. Sarah said it means to not have sexual intercourse during her menses. Good job, good job. Same answer from Yasmin. Good job, Sister Evelyn. Good job, Fame. Good job, May. Good job, Tony. It doesn't mean they need to stay in a separate room and stay there until the woman is clean. The prophet was with Um Salama once. Good job. Look how she's using the hadith. And she got up. He asked her, did you start your menses? She said, yes. He told her to come back to bed. Exactly, Um Salama. I mean, exactly, Sister Khadijah. That shows there's nothing wrong with being near a woman or being affectionate as long as they don't have relations of intercourse. Exactly. So this is something that a lot of Muslim men, believe it or not, they don't understand. Why? Because as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, we're a simple-minded nation. So we have to make it clear. The Prophet had to break things down to the companions and make it clear to them, okay? Because of that simple-mindedness. And we have to do the same thing today. You don't have to leave your home. Let's see what they put on Zoom. Let's see. Uh, Precious said no relations while during the menses. However, he, she may cook, clean, cuddle, do all other things for her husband. Good with her husband. Good job, Precious. Just stay away from having relations. Good job, Sister Howa. Good job, Sister Omar Hare. <laughs> Sister Omar Hare is here. Good job, Brother Colic. Good job, Sister Rashida. You still value her, show respect and love, but do not seek intercourse. Exactly. So that's all that means. When the uh, Allah says refrain, he's saying, you know, no intimate like that. No, no relations with her. You can hug her, you can do all the other stuff, but no relations until she's clean. And that brings us to number three, question number three. Let me put it up here so you guys can see. Question number three, true or false? It is forbidden for a man to hug his wife when she is on her menses. True or false? It's forbidden for a man to hug his wife when she's on her menses. Is that statement true or false? It's forbidden for a man to hug his wife when she's on her menses. Masha Allah, this is false. But believe it or not, guys, there's a lot of men who think that, that, that this is true. There's a lot of men out there who do not hug or touch their wives because they believe that doing so, you know, is, is something we are forbidden to do because she's on her men's seats. Good job. Everybody got that right on Facebook too. Okay, let's look at number four, true or false. 
let me, oh, let me put this up. I'm sorry. I thought I had it for y'all to see it. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let's look at number four. True or false? If a woman is on her menses and touches a man, his voodoo is broken. Is that true or false? If a woman is on her menses and touches a man, his voodoo is broken. Is that statement true or false? Masha'Allah, this is false, but you'd be surprised how many emails I get from brothers telling me, Sister Layla, I went to the grocery store to go grocery shopping and my hand touched the, the teller's hand. What if she's on her menses? Do I have to take a gusso and, and take a, make a new voodoo because she could have been on her menses? Oh my God, there's people that believe that. The answer is no. A woman does is not an animal. We're human beings. A woman does not inv inv invalidate your voodoo nor your prayer, you know, by touching you if she's on her menses. Exactly as Zarina said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made prayer behind his menstruating wife, Aisha, and he would touch her leg to, to, for her to move it, okay? When he prostrated, so this is false. So a lot of those misconceptions about women, guys, and by the way, even though this is the year 2020, you see that we women still suffer with the same misconceptions that men had about us back then. Like I said, there is nothing that we're experiencing on earth today that has not already been experienced by those companions. Women were looked down on and treated the same way that they're treated today that they were back then. It's not that nothing's really changed. We really have not progressed as much as we think as a nation. We may have progressed in our knowledge of technology, but we have not progressed much in regards to our knowledge and understanding of Islam. We're still the, at the same place that we were back then, some of us even worse, because least the companions would accept whatever the prophet and Allah said. If the companions were misinformed on a topic, once they learned the truth, they accepted it. Muslims today won't even accept. They were the, they still look towards the science, as Sheikh Morsi says. They still look towards the science and try to use science to refute what Allah says. The companions didn't do that. So we're worse. We have not progressed spiritually much at all. And that's why I say the chances of us being of the forerunners are slim. As the law says, most of the forerunners will be from the early generations. Only a few, he said only a few from the later generations. And this is why the faith gets weaker and weaker each generation. The companions would accept what the law says. No, not us. We want to argue, refute it, use science and all of that. Subhanallah. So ignorant. Exactly. As Sister Laley says, very ignorant. But it's happening. Yesterday is an example. Okay, let's look at question number five. Also, Allah says in the interpretation of the meaning, your wife, your wife is a tillage for you. So go to your tillage as you will. What is the meaning of that verse? Again, it's all about breaking these verses of the Quran down into plain, simple English so that you English speaking people can understand what Allah is saying. Okay. What is Allah saying when he says your wife is a tillage? Approach your wife however you want. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. Most people, most people don't know what, what a tillage is. This, these, this, this is English that we don't even, English, that just like American history, you'd be crazy to try to figure out. The same with our English language. The American English language changes every day too. So messed up. But any, we don't even speak that way anymore. But what is, does Allah mean when he says your wife is a tillage? 
So approach your tillage however you want. What does that mean in plain, simple English? Awa said it means you can have relations with your wife in whatever position you want, except when she's on her menses and anus. Brother Tarek said this verse is talking about the intimate relations between a man and his wife, how when it comes to these relations, there's no prohibition. Good job, Tarek, except for the few clearly defined by a law. Exactly, Brother Tarek. Brother Kalik said it means when husband is ready to go, have sex, go to her, okay? Sister Israel said there are no limits as to how, what positions, exactly. However you want, Sister Fatima, good job, exactly. That's what that means. I'm gonna use Brother Tarek's answer because his is more uh, whatever, you know, Facebook. Okay, it simply means this verse is speaking about the intimate relations between a man and his wife and how when it comes to these relations, there's no other prohibitions. The only prohibitions are the few that have been clearly defined by a law. That's it, nothing else. You can enjoy your wife, your husband, how, uh-oh. You can enjoy your wife or your husband however you want. Un exactly, as Sister Elma said, which is contrary to what the Jews were saying, because the Jews were trying to find another way to make fun of the of the of the Arabs, because a lot of the Arabic women, the uh, Ansar women, were cross-eyed. So they tried to say that they were cross-eyed because of the way they had intimacy with their husbands, different positions. And the prophet said, this is not true. You approach your wives however you want, except avoiding the two things that Allah said to avoid. Okay, let's look at question number six. Also Allah says, and this is another verse that people skip over because they don't understand it or they don't want to understand it. Allah also says in that verse, send ahead something for your souls. What does that mean? Allah is speaking about a man and his relationship with his wife. He says, before a man enters into a relationship with his wife of that nature, send something ahead for his soul. What does that mean? And a lot of men don't, they simply ignore that sentence. Send something ahead. What is, does that mean? To send something ahead. What does it mean? To send something ahead. What do you guys think? Okay, uh, who is this? Elma said to be gentle with your wife before fulfilling your desire with her, play with her, make her laugh or anything else, which will put her at ease and then fulfill your desires with her. This is, this makes sure she doesn't feel used. MashaAllah, this is important. Do you know how many women feel used by their husbands? Because their husband, we're living in 2020, this is almost 2021. And there are a lot of men who still look down on women and treat them like they're nothing but a, an intimacy machine. That they're on, they only spend time with their wife and come around when they want intimacy. So Allah is saying, don't do that. You know, spend some time with your wife, talk with her. Don't let her feel like she's just being used for that. As you guys can see, you see how Islam is not just a religion but it's a beautiful way of life. And do you guys see how there is nothing? I try to emphasize that in my dawah. There is nothing that we experience in this world that has not already been addressed because the women experience or the men experience the same thing in the prophet's time. Like I said, the only thing that's changed, people are the same. The only thing that's changed is technology. 
but we have not changed much in our understanding of the religion. Many of us have gone downhill because we don't have the understanding of those companions. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Good answer. Uh, Rashida said, be kind, show kindness. Good job. Fatima Dia said, send a gift to her or spend time with her so she doesn't feel used. Exactly, Fatima. Brother Tarek, this sentence means that there should be gentleness, kindness, and compassion between the spouses before, beforehand. We should be taking the time to appreciate the little things about each other, taking the time to do what we can in order to make each other feel important and loved. Exactly. Brother Tarek, you're going to make a woman a great husband. Whenever you do get married, Brother Tarek, inshallah, you're going to make a woman a great husband because you understand what your role is as a man and you understand the rights of women. And we need more men like you. Alhamdulillah. Sister Awa said it means that before intercourse, the same answer. Good job, Awa. Good job, Sister Isra. No, it doesn't, it doesn't mean seek refuge in Allah from shaitan. No, that's not what it means. It means do something nice for your wife. So she does not feel used. She does not feel like she's just a sex machine for you. Let's see what answers we have on Facebook. Let me see. Sister Evelyn, she said, when Allah says that, he's simply telling us to be good to your wife. Exactly, Evelyn. Treat your wife well before intimacy. Khadija says, do something nice for her. Be romantic. Get her a gift. Send her flowers before you just satisfy your needs. So she doesn't feel used. Exactly. Sarah said, give some good treatment to her. Even nice words. Exactly. Laylee said it means to have foreplay and ask Allah for blessings. Not really that is no, it's talking about what the other people said. You know, it's not really about asking for blessings or none of that. It's talking about, you know, don't use the woman, don't like make the woman feel like she's just a paramour, like she's your mistress, your lover, your sex fiend. Ikra said be, to treat her nicely, give her gifts. Exactly. Spend time with her. Don't make her just a piece of meat. Look at how the women are wording this. Do you see how the way we word this, that there's not that, that there's a lot of men out there who don't treat their wives rightly. We hear about it. We're not experiencing it because none of the sisters on my website would tolerate that. We're all, like Dr. Jamali said, we're strong here at Sunnah. But we're people of the Sunnah. We're like the companions. We, we wouldn't tolerate it. We're not going to tolerate a man abusing us. We, we do a kula in a heartbeat. But we hear about the other women, how there are so many other Muslim women out there who are treated like a piece of meat. Exactly, Ikra. Brother Bilal said, love her, not only in bed, but in everyday life. Be gentle and kind. Nurture her. Raise her up. Masha Allah. This is a good man here. You can tell who's a good man here and how he addressed it because very few men nurture their wives. Very few men are gentle and kind. If you have a husband that's telling you to be ugly, is that kind? If you have a husband that's telling you he wants you to dress in shabby clothes, he wants you to go out the house looking trifling, is that nurturing a woman? No, that strips a woman of her self-esteem. That makes the woman feel like she's worthless. I'm only supposed to be beautiful and attractive to you. I'm only supposed to put on makeup and put on nice clothes when I'm behind a closed door with you so you can use me for your gratification. But when I'm done being used by you, I have to go out and face the rest of the world as a shabby, torn, broken woman, a stock fear law that is not Islam. That is not what the prophet told his wives. That is not what he taught us as women. 
The total opposite is what he taught. So I'm here to let you sisters know if you're living like that, you have some man who has broken you because I get the phone calls from sisters who have been broken in their spirit, in their, their, their self-esteem flushed down the toilet because a man, instead of nurturing her, the prophet said, if you bend a woman too hard, you'll break her. Some of these men marry the women and the women are attractive women. So you break her. Tell her that you don't want her to dress nice anymore. You don't want her to wear makeup anymore. You don't want her to wear heels anymore. She has to dress in black. And by the way, black is very sexy and attractive. You don't want to see Layla Nasheba in black, brothers. You can't handle my colors. Don't let me. Hey, I got a little black here. You can get a little hint of it. Hold on for a second. Let me show y'all what black, how sexy black can be. You brothers with that. Hold on. Where is that a virtual thing we did, sisters? We do a lot here after the classes here. Where's my uh, jewelry? Hold on. Put my jewelry on. Can you imagine this? Look what black does. Black accessorizes. Don't put a woman on black because all she got to do is put some gold on and that's a beautiful thing to see, Akis. So yeah, having me wear black, you would be wishing I'd wear red, green, or any other color because black is one color that I do try to avoid because it brings out my complexion and my brows and my eyes and make them pop, pop, pop. Can you see? And this ain't even real. Okay. So stop trying to oppress women like that. Women can wear any colors and Allah made us beautiful. Allah loves beauty. As long as a woman is not out on the street trying to prostitute herself, you brother stop breaking your wives cause your wives call me and your wives cry to me about what you do to them. And you know what I tell them, cooler. Don't break your wives. Thank Allah for, I don't even know what they saw in you anyway, because I wouldn't have married you. The, uh, I don't know why these sisters marry these type of men, because uh, I wouldn't be married to a man like that, not even for, uh, for um, a second. Try to break me of my self-esteem. Try to break me because you can't, you're jealous and you can't handle the fact you that insecure about your manhood. Do your job as a man. Nurture your wives like this brother type. Let me go back to that answer he gave. Nurture your wives. Make your wives feel, feel special. Make your wife feel loved. And then you wouldn't be so insecure that you tell her to go out the house ugly and shabby. A stuck feel law. Allah hates ugliness. He loves beauty. Ugly is not one of his attributes. Beauty is. Okay, subhanAllah. Okay, so again, guys, that's what that verse means. You know, you know, it means, you know, before you approach your wives in that manner, do something nice for her, make her feel loved, make her feel nurtured, make her feel special. So that way she doesn't feel that she's just your sex toy. She can only get dressed up for you to use her. And then when you're done with her, toss her to the side and say, Go and be a shabby, torn woman. A stuck filler. Okay, last question. List the three things that Islam forbids. There's only three things. There's only three things that Islam forbids a husband and wife to do intimately, guys. What are the three things that Allah forbids a husband and wife to do intimately. Yeah, I try to avoid black. Y'all don't want to ever see me in black. I avoid it. I get too much attention from Muslims and non-Muslims if I put on black and put on my gold accessories. It's over. And I know a lot of women like that. 
And don't ask me to cover my face because my eyes will pop like crazy in black too. Just my eyes showing, I'll pop like crazy. I, I gotta be careful wearing a mask. Where's that, um, sisters, why they wait? I'm waiting on this answer. While y'all put y'all answer there, what are the three things? And why y'all, you don't want me to put no mask on, brothers. I can't leave the house with my mask. Look, if I leave the house with my mask on, look, look how my, I pop. Some women are beautiful and they pop where they, you can't hide them. Supana Allah, I got a mask on now, Aki. I'm still popping. Pop, pop, pop. Stop trying to oppress women. You cannot break her. What Allah gave her, he gave her. You lucky she chose you because pop, pop, Layla wouldn't choose you. Pop, pop. Look at that, with the mask. Don't let me, you don't want me to cover my face. I was married to a man once. This is a true story. And some of you sisters here like Fred's don't know what I'm talking about. I was married to a man once who wanted me to cover my face. And I covered it and he said, excuse me, take the, take the, uh, take the, take it off. Just wear, show your face. Yeah, cause I'm popping. Don't ask me to cover my face. You can't handle it. Can't handle black and the mask on Layla. It's the truth. Where are those answers at? What are the three things? I tell y'all, I like this Zoom. I can really give y'all examples with this Zoom. Tell me if it ain't popping for Team Moon. You know it's popping. What are the three things that we have to avoid, sisters? Yeah, brothers can't handle. I got brothers messaging me to take my mask off. See that? Can't handle me with a mask. You don't want me to cover my face, Aki. I can rock a one eye too. You know that? I can rock anything, a one eye too. Because you know why? I'm gonna tell you guys why you can't hide what Allah is giving it. Where my other mask at? Where my rock at? Okay, here. You don't want me, this is the one I wear and I go to the store. I can rock a one eye, two eye, and a three. Let me tell you something, guys. You want to know why it is that you can't break a woman. Because beauty lies in the eye of the beholder. And beauty emanates from within. If the person is a beautiful person from within, it em remember the prophet, everything I teach y'all goes back to that prophet. And that's sooner. The prophet said, whatever is in your heart, it's going to manifest itself through your body, through your limbs. So if I'm a beautiful person in my heart, Aki, even with this mask on, I'm rocking it. I'm rocking it. You can't strip me of that beauty. Put me in black. Give me a one eye. That one eye will rock and rock and rock. Because it comes from the heart. And that's what I want you sisters to teach your daughters. Teach your daughters. Can't nobody break you. The prophet warned men. He warned them, don't break them. If you got it inside in your heart, they can't strip it out. You might have a meltdown. I mean, come on, you a woman. Women are very emotional. You might have a meltdown. Like I had a meltdown yesterday. Yeah, I had a meltdown. Mashallah, Layla had a meltdown. But I'm back. It didn't break me. I just had a moment. We're all entitled to a moment. Okay. All right. What are the three things that we cannot do? Let's see if I got these answers. Let's look on Facebook first. I asked this before, I know, but I didn't get all three. I want all three answers too. Let's see. Laylee said, do not have relations during menstruation. Okay, I want all three answers, guys, not just one or two. Every Muslim should know all three. I'm rocking that mask. Don't ask me to cover my face. That ex-husband I had, he told me, take the, take the niqab off. He said, don't ever wear a niqab. I said, I told you. 
I can rock anything. Give me the one eye. I'll rock it. Remember that phrase now? Let's see. Evelyn said menses from the, okay, yeah, we need all three. Every time I ask this question every year when I teach this class, I never can get all three answers. I want to see who can give me all three. Yeah, I'm rocking that niqab, ain't I? Let's see. Uh, only Barrel, you forgot. You didn't give me all three either. Ikra didn't give me all three either. May, you know, ask your husband what all three are. May, ask your husband to, to remind you as to what the three things are that we cannot do. Sister Khadijah got it right. Who else got it right? Only person got it right on Facebook is Khadijah. Brother Bilal. Exactly. Brother Bilal got it right. The brother that knows how to, what the, oh, I'm, look at me trying to touch my mask. I'm sitting here trying to move this mask. Now, man, you know that's crazy. I sat here, let me move this mask. <laughs> when I was working, we had to wear it off for eight hours. And I hate wearing a mask for eight hours because it breaks your face out. Brother Bilal got it right. Let's see who got it on Zoom. Brother Bilal and Khadijah, the only two that got it right on Facebook. Let's see who got it right on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> I got a side view. Even a side view, still rocking it. Still rocking it. You men who want to oppress women, you can't oppress Sister Layla. Rocking it. I told you I can do the eye, the one eye, good rock, a good rock. Let's see, who got it on the Zoom room? <laughs> brother Tarek got it right. Good job, brother Tarek. Zarina, intercourse on Menses. The other part, you only got two, Zarina. Precious, you're really wrong. <laughs> Women, let's see. Sister AY got it right. Sister Fatima Dia got it right. Sister Isra got it right. Good job. Four of you on there and the two on Facebook. And like I say, every time, let me take this mask off because I can't, seriously, guys, I can't breathe in it. It's making me go into anxiety. That anxiety is a serious thing. Even though I don't really have a mask on, my mind, this is how you know I'm, I'm still not, I'm still sick. My mind is telling me, Layla, you having a hard time breathing. Pull your mask down. So I'm going to take the mask off. But I think I illustrated my point. For you men who want to oppress women, beauty emanates from within. Like the prophet said, whatever is in your heart, it's going to show through your outer appearance. So take those chains off the women. I look better with my face covered. And don't dare ask me to wear black. All right. But those are the three answers. I ask it every year and people get it wrong. They forget that third one. We already know, number one, no relations on menses. Number two, no backdoor action. Number three, do not disclose your secrets to others. In other words, what goes on behind closed doors is supposed to stay behind closed doors. And unfortunately, there are a lot of Muslims out there who need to fear a law with that. I don't have a problem with you sisters posting pictures of yourselves with hijabs on, on Facebook. But what I have a problem with is what the prophet would have a problem with. You posting up the intimacy of your husband on Facebook. Long as you got a hijab on, I could care less about any pictures you post because you're covered properly. That's lawful. I'm not going to make something unlawful because I don't have any insecurities. But now when I see you post up a picture of you and your husband making out on Facebook, I got a problem with that because you're now transgressing the limits of a law. 
And that's the problem. We got to learn to love what Allah loves and only hate what Allah hates. You hate women who post up pictures. That's something that you have to deal with within yourself. What you should hate is them making out with their husbands publicly. Some things need to stay in the, at home behind closed doors or the women boasting and bragging about what their husbands did for them or the men boasting and bragging about how good a wife they woman is and not about cooking and stuff, but sexual ways, how sexually uh, their sexual their wives are. And there's a lot of men on Facebook doing that. That stuff is haram, okay? But you posting a picture up with a hijab on is not haram. Everybody get it? Let's focus on what's really haram and stop trying to make things that you don't like haram. If you're that weak, if a man is that weak that he can't stand to see a woman, a beautiful woman, and he needs to stop, close your, delete your Facebook account. Because again, we all have different weaknesses. If something bothers you, if something triggers your gin, then you stay away from the evil. Don't go near it. If you can't handle seeing a woman in a hijab on Facebook, then delete Facebook and just look at them at the mosque, I guess. Okay, but you can't tell women it's haram because you don't like it or tell her to be shabby because you don't like to see a woman attractive. Cause there's women out there like Layla that, that can rock shabbiness too. Some of us can rock, rock what you call shabby. Like I just showed you. Covering your face, wearing black, you think it's shabby. Well, it ain't for me. Don't, you don't wanna see me in it. Exactly sisters. That's what y'all tell those brothers. Okay, any questions about any of these answers? You see why they don't like me? Now do y'all see why these men don't want you listening to Layla Nasheba? And this is how they were about Aisha. A lot of people send me emails asking me, why is it that even today, a lot of people hate Aisha? Did y'all, uh, Layla can tell you. In different parts of the world, they really hate Aisha. Well, do you see why? Just like they hate, like here in America, they hate Layla. Because the same way that Layla keeps it real, that's how Aisha was. Aisha kept it real based on the Quran and, and what the prophet said, not some person's personal distorted of opinion. Only a law has the authority to make things haram, not no man, because he put a title in front of his name. All he's doing is showing his weakness as a man. Man up, as Aisha would say, but leave the women alone. Islam is hard enough for us, especially this day and age. We are living in the COVID and there's a new strain of the COVID virus out. They say it's even more contagious than the other. So we women are stuck in the house. We women can't go anywhere anyway. At least you do. At least you're supposed to be at the mosque praying. We women are stuck at home. And you want to oppress us more by telling us that we can't put a picture saying, look, I got a new hijab on Facebook. Are you out your mind? Go deal with yourself. And like I say, for those that don't like Layla, you would hate Aisha. You join the, the, the boat. Because you don't know anything about the prophet or his companions, especially not the females. The female companions, none of them played. Not just Aisha, none of them played with that crap. Those were strong women. Bantu! Subhanallah. So take that stuff somewhere, that Jewish stuff. You know, a lot of people like the prophet said, you know, you resemble the Jews in your looks. You resemble the Jews in the way you speak and the way you act. Well, the companions wives didn't have Jew in them. They, they had Bantu. SubhanAllah. Originated from out of Yemen, Aki. All right. We'll talk about that today in the chat. Any questions about any of these questions? 
before we move to today's lecture. Any questions about any of those answers? Because today's lecture is going to be the last lecture on this topic of relations between husband and wife. No questions on any of those answers. Let me uh, put the PowerPoint up here and also change my background. But let me put the PowerPoint up first. The PowerPoint's not that long. Hold on. I do want to finish this today to move on to tomorrow's uh, lawful and unlawful. Let me find it. Where is it at? Wait a minute. Hold on, guys. Let me find it in my folder. Oh, here it is. I'm in the wrong folder. Okay, this is it. This should, okay, good. I was going to say, I know I uh, fixed it yesterday before I got that phone call. Okay, hold on. Let me come to here. And let me change my uh, background because this is the class now. Where's my background picture? Here we go. This is a clue as to what the last topic of this series is about. The lawful and the unlawful in regards to what? What can you see from the picture here, guys? What does this picture tell you that the last topic on relations between the sexes is about? Exactly, birth control. This is a big question that many, oh, even Brother Shaddy got it right. Our little 10-year-old, he knew this. How do you know about birth control, Shaddy? Mom, he'd been in your, your, your drawer. But anyway, he's been in his mother's drawer. But anyway, this is what it's about, birth control. Exactly. And a lot of Muslims, believe it or not, ask us the questions. <laughs> they ask us the question, Sister Layla, is birth control lawful in Islam? And this is what we're going to speak about today. Let me put the PowerPoint up here on the screen so everybody can see. I like that purple, too. I wish I had wore my purple hijab. I should have had the purple hijab on. You know, we got we sisters have to keep it real when we're on TV. And I'd like to thank my entourage, uh, Sister May, uh, who's part of my um, makeup crew, Sister Latifa, Sister Fatima. You know, they're all part, and Sister Omar Hare, they're all part of my, um, they're my stylists. They make sure that my hijabs are styled and I look okay and all that so I can be on live TV or whatever this is. But let me put the PowerPoint up here. Hold on here. Okay, you guys should be able to see it in a minute. Hold on. All right, new share portion of the screen. Okay, here we go. Okay, inshallah, you guys should be able to see the PowerPoint, okay? So this is the last topic, uh, the last uh, lecture of this topic, birth control. We're going to speak about birth control and also abortion. Many questions come up about abortion too, okay? First of all, the preservation of the human species is unquestionably the primary objective of marriage. In other words, what is the purpose of getting married? The purpose of getting married is to procreate. Allah himself tells us that. So a lot of sisters may come to me and say, Sister Layla, I want to get married. What's a question I should have my guardian ask? Ask the man or the woman, if you are a man, how do they feel about children? Because if you're ready to get married, if you're getting married because you want to have children, and this person is telling you that they won't, don't want to have any, that's going to be a problem because one of the purposes of seeking marriage is to procreate, okay? So, but now maybe a couple does get married and they decide they want to put off having a child. Perhaps they're both in school. Maybe they're trying to finish up their, their, their college degree or maybe they're, they want to wait a couple of years to save up money can they use birth control? The correct answer is yes, but it comes with conditions. Yes, birth control is lawful, but it comes with conditions. We have a hadith where one of the companions tells us we practice coitus interruptus during the time of the prophet while the Quran was being revealed. Um, another uh, translation, he said, we practice coitus interruptus during the time of the prophet 
And when he learned about it, he did not forbid us from doing it. And uh, coitus interruptus is, as everyone know, the pulling out, okay? The prophet said there's nothing wrong with that, okay? We have another hadith where a man came and said, oh, prophet of Allah, I have a slave girl. I desire what men desire from her, but I don't want her to get pregnant. So I practice coitus interruptus with her. The Jews say that this is a minor form of killing your children. The prophet said the Jews are wrong. If Allah wishes to create a child, you can't stop it. And this is what we say even today. A lot of Muslims, like I said, we have not progressed much Islamically. We have progressed in technology. We have the pills, we have the shots and all this other stuff, but our understanding has not progressed. Just like there were people who believe that coitus interruptus was the same as killing a child. We have Muslims today that say, if you take birth control pills, you're killing the child. If you get the shot, you're killing the child. If you use any type of contraceptive, you're killing the child. Well, that hadith makes them all look foolish. So there you have it from the prophet. These things are lawful. The condition is it cannot be something that will cause sterility. It cannot be something that will cause you to become sick to the point where your, your organs don't work and you can't procreate. That's the condition. So any type of birth control is lawful as long as it doesn't cause sterility as long as it doesn't make it a permanent thing. So if you want to take the shot, go ahead. The pill, go ahead. Condoms, go ahead. IUD, go ahead. As long as it doesn't cause you to become sterile or destroy your reproductive organs. And that's what the prophet says. So when you hear these ignorant Muslims, because like I said, people have not changed. There's no question that hasn't already been addressed. You're killing your children. Astaghfirullah. Sister, you have an IUD. You're killing your children. This is the same as burying a child a lot. No, it's not. The, as the prophet said, you are wrong. As long as it doesn't cause sterility. If Allah wishes a child to be made, it's going to be made. And by the way, guys, there are many women, I am sure, sitting in this website right now, who can tell you that they've had children while they were taking the pill. They got pregnant. Or I had an IUD, Sister Layla, and I still got pregnant. Or we used a condom and I still got pregnant. So again, as the prophet say, if Allah says B, whether you're using a pill or anything, it's going to happen. As long as whatever you're doing or using does not cause sterility. Okay? And also there's another condition. The second condition for using birth control is both of the spouses have to be in agreement. Again, one of the reasons that we do marry is to procreate. If you did not want to have children, you should have told her so she wouldn't have married you. But you cannot tell your wife, you don't want to have no kids, so I want you to get on the pill. No. Unless getting pregnant will cause her harm. There are some women, for example, if you have, they, use these, they used to say if you had uh, three C-sections, they would recommend that you tie your tubes because the chances of you surviving another C-section are slim. In a case like that, then, you know, to save your life, then that's different. Okay? But they say you should have an honest, reliable physician who's telling you that, a Muslim physician that tells you that if getting pregnant would cause a harm to you. Allah says in the Quran, in the interpretation of meaning, do not be cast into ruin by your own hands. Do not kill yourselves and all of that. So if a doctor, a Muslim doctor tells you that getting pregnant may endanger your life or your health, then you know, uh, you can use birth control whether your spouse agrees to it or not. But if it's not a life endangerment, you too have to agree on it. 
Okay? Does everybody understand that? We have a hadith here that a man came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, I practice coitus interruptus with my wife. The Prophet said, why do you do that? He said, because I'm afraid for her children. The Prophet said, if the pregnancy were harmful, if, if, if the pregnancy of a nursing woman were harmful, it would have harmed the Persians and the Greeks. What happened here is this was a companion, Usama ibn Zaid, the son of Zaid and uh, Baraka. He's one that's telling us that a man came to the prophet and said, my wife had a baby already and she's nursing. I don't want her to get pregnant again. So I'm gonna use birth control. The prophet asked him why. He said, well, I'm afraid that if she got pregnant while she's nursing, it's gonna harm the child. And that's when the prophet said, if that were true, it would have harmed the Persians and the Greeks because they nurse and get pregnant. But as you can see, the prophet still did not tell him he couldn't do it. He just told him there was no fear, no need to fear something happening to the child. So again, like if your doctor tell you, you know, you just had a baby, but you might need to wait three or four months before you get pregnant again, then you can take um, uh, birth control during that time until the doctor thinks you're healthy. Or say your doctor tells you that if you get pregnant, you will have a mongoloid or a deformed child, then you can use birth control in that case too. So birth control is lawful guys, okay? With those conditions, okay? And uh, this is the same thing repeating. So birth control is lawful. And uh, again, anyone that tells you that it's killing the child, you know that that person's ignorant of Islam because you've seen the hadiths where the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam allowed it, okay? So that brings us to another question that unfortunately many Muslim women have to ask. What about abortion? What about abortion? Is it lawful to have an abortion in Islam? Well, let's review that right now. Even though Islam allows birth control, it does not allow violence to the pregnancy, you know, unless the doctor tells you that you're pregnant and, uh, um, you know, the child, you know, having a child might endanger your life. In a case like that, and he recommends an abortion because if the child is born, you could die or something like that, you know, then abortion may be um, permissible in a case like that because Allah does not want you to sacrifice your life for the life of a fetus that has not yet acquired a personality. So say, for example, you're married, you got pregnant, and it's the beginning of the pregnancy. The, it has not become a fetus. The scholars unanimously agree that after the fetus is completely formed, this is haram because you're killing a soul. But if the soul has not yet been breathed into the child, and your doctor is telling you having that child will endanger your life, then you can have an abortion. Does everybody understand that? I'm trying to break that down in simple terms. You get pregnant. You find out you're pregnant. You're in the beginning. It's, it's just, a, it's not a fetus yet. But the doctor found out that if you have that baby, you could die because of whatever disease you have. You can abort it as long as it doesn't have a soul. And this is what the scholars agree on, okay? So that type of abortion would be lawful, okay? But the question that I get a lot, what about this? A woman is raped. I received a lot of emails like this. She's raped. Can she get an abortion? Well, now days you have this pill called the day after pill. 
And if a woman is raped, she needs to immediately contact a doctor and the police too and report that she's been raped. Because if you go to a doctor, they will give you the day after pill, which will cause you to abort if you are, if you should get pregnant. So see how a law says there's a cure for every sickness, even rape. The cure for the sickness of rape and not getting pregnant is to immediately go to a doctor so they can give you the pill that will prevent you from getting pregnant. Okay, so thanks to the technology, that's what you do in a case of rape. Okay, if there were not the pill, many of the scholars say the same thing. You could, as if you get an abortion, it would have to be before the child becomes a fetus. If you are raped and you get pregnant, you need to do it before the child becomes a fetus. That's what many of the scholars used to say, but now that we have that the day after pill, they tell you to go take the day after pill. So that way you don't have to deal with it. But say for example, a husband and wife get, uh, uh, get pregnant, the man decides he wants to divorce the wife and she's five months pregnant, that's a fetus. No, you cannot have an abortion, okay? Or say a husband and wife get married and they decide they don't want it. Can they have an abortion then? No. Again, the abortion is only if the woman's life is in danger or only if she's been raped or, uh, or abused that way. That's the only two instances in which uh, the scholars say that it's okay and it has to be done before the child becomes a fetus. But just to have an abortion because you just want one, no, that don't happen. To have an abortion because you decide you don't want to be pregnant no more, no, that don't happen. Abortion because you committed fornication outside of wedlock, no, and that's important. I know a lot of Muslims that try to get abortions for their girls who then had sex out of wedlock. Sorry, that's illegal. She made her bed. She got to lie in it, literally. Your daughter made her bed, so she has to lie in it. You get an abortion, this is killing a child. Supana Allah. Again, the only conditions is the mother's life in danger or rape. Okay. All right, so again, other than that, uh, birth control is lawful as long as it doesn't cause sterility. Abortion is a horrific sin unless the mother's life is in danger or the person's been raped. And whenever I talk about this, I always get this question and I'm gonna answer it. Dear Sister Layla, what if a girl has been raped as a child, when she gets the age of marriage, do I have to tell any man who wants to marry her that she's no longer a virgin? Well, I'm gonna give you the answer. Now you hear other people answer that question based on uh, a school of thought or an imam. No, whenever there's something like that, that is not made clear, we look to see what did the prophet say about that. If you can't find anything that the prophet said, then what did the companion say? Well, I'm going to answer that question because I heard it asked recently, and I was uh, appalled at the answer that this imam gave. I'm going to give you the correct answer. And why is my answer correct? Because the answer I'm going to give you is the answer Umar gave. Again, you have to know the companions. Most of these Muslims today, they're all into science and brag about their PhDs and, and all that nonsense, but they know nothing of the companions. So they sit there and answer these questions based on their opinion and, and some other person's opinion that's famous. No, no, no. Everything goes back to the prophet and those companions because no one understood the dean better than they did, but they don't know about the companions, so they can't answer. They don't know that rape happened during the caliph of Umar. When Umar was the caliphate, 
a man came to him. He said, oh, Umar, my daughter has been soiled. Her life is ruined. What am I to do? He said, I'll never be able to find her a husband because she's been soiled. What do I do? Umar said, well, first thing you gonna do is tell me who soiled her. So the man told him he, her, his brother soiled her. So Umar said, okay, he ordered that that man be arrested. And that man was executed. He had him executed for raping that girl. But that's another story. And so Umar ordered that the man who soiled the girl pay for it with his life. And then Umar looked at the man because the man was mortified. He said, I'll never find a husband for her because she's not a virgin. No one's going to want to marry her because she's not a virgin. Umar looked at the man and said, you are wrong. She is a virgin. He said, she may have lost a piece of the flesh. But no man has touched her soul. No man has penetrated her heart. She has not experienced love in its beauty, in its true beauty. He said, so raise your head up high. He told the man, you have no shame. And if any man comes asking for your daughter in marriage, she is a virgin because all she lost was a piece of flesh. And whatever man marries her, she will experience the true feelings that a virgin experience when she's touched lovingly. So she's a virgin. That's the answer. But when I listened to this famous scholar, well, this famous speaker on Facebook just last week, he was asked that question. He didn't give that answer. And he's very famous. Y'all love him. But see, that's what happens as Sheikh Morsi say. We become famous and we deviate away from Islam and its truthfulness. We don't know that these things were already addressed in the time of the prophet and the companions. So that's the answer I give you. If you have a daughter who's been raped, no, you don't have to tell anybody she was raped because she's still a virgin. She's never tasted the sweetness of the touch of a man. And her reaction will be the same as any other virgin's reaction is when she tastes the sweetness of a man. As long as you don't strip your daughter, as long as you don't strip your daughters of that self-esteem, of that natural pride, you raise your daughters. He took a piece of skin from you. That's all he took. He didn't take nothing else. Not your self-esteem, not your pride or any of that. It's how we raise our children, how we nurture them based on the understanding of those companions. Y'all see that? If you're living Islam with the understanding of Umar, who will be the second person to enter paradise after the prophet, then you can handle, you know what to do if rape happens. You nurture that beautiful girl. Let her know he took just a piece of flesh. It's all about bringing back Islam and its truthfulness, guys with the understanding of the companions. Not Islam in the watered down version we have today, based on how many followers we have, as Jamali said, how many people are like us, what part of the world I can travel and speak a good game to. 
It's not about how many pamphlets we put out about how to be happy because the prophet taught us how to be happy, just like Umar taught a woman how to recover from rape and be happy. I don't need you to come and teach my people how to deal with rape. Umar taught it. Hello, goodbye. All right, so inshallah guys, this is the last of that series on relationship between the sexes. Tomorrow, I'm gonna give you a quiz to cover what we discussed today. And then we're gonna move on to the next topic of the lawful and the unlawful, which I believe is uh, social relationships. What is lawful and unlawful in regards to our social relationships? That's gonna be the next topic. So we'll stop right here. If you guys have any uh, questions, or com uh, questions or comments, Insha'Allah, you can go ahead and type them on the screen. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika. Shalom la ilaha illa.